Praise. Thank you, Lord. Please have a seat. And we're going to continue. Ushers, if you could get the Nutella ready, we're going <laughs> to. Just kidding. Uh, I'm beyond the days of eating Nutella. My diet has changed, but for you young guys, enjoy. <laughs> All right. Well, I'd like to speak today about our beloved congregation, City of David. Are you thankful for this congregation? I am. I love this congregation, and not just because I'm the rabbi. I'm not sure if you heard the story of the Jewish mother who went in to wake up her son to tell him to get ready to go to shul. Get up. He replied, I'm not going. Why not, she asked. I'll give you two good reasons, he said. One, they don't like me. And two, I don't like them. (laughs) His mother replied, I'll give you two good reasons. You should go to shul. Eh? One, you're 54 years old. (laughs) Grow up. And two, you're the rabbi. (laughs) Well, unlike that rabbi, I love coming to shul. I love the people of our congregation. I love the vision of our congregation. I love the commitment of the people in this congregation. And I love what we stand for, rather who we stand for. We stand for something in this community. We stand for someone. 
Yeshua the Messiah. He is alive from the dead. That's the message going out from this congregation. And regarding our congregation, I want to speak about two broad topics. And by the way, what I share about our congregation, the principles I'm going to talk about, apply to every, it applies to the home life. It applies to running a business. It applies even to our own personal lives within ourselves. So this is very relevant if you'll just apply it in, in different areas, but I am applying it to our congregation. And the first broad topic is the spiritual atmosphere or the environment of the congregation. As you know, or should know, one of the great purposes of this congregational community is to produce victorious, so first of all, to be a disciple, to be and produce victorious, fruit-bearing disciples who follow and obey Messiah Yeshua. That's one of the great purposes of our community. And I want us to look at Matthew chapter 28, Matthew 28, verse 18. Very familiar verses. Uh, then Yeshua came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. As I said, we acknowledge that authority here. We yield to that authority. All authority. Sooner or later, the whole world will bow to his authority. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, Immersing them, meaning in water, in the name of Ha'av, the Father, Ha'ben, the Son, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Teach them to obey. That's why we say victorious fruit-bearing disciples who follow and obey Messiah, not just in tongue, but in deed. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. <clears throat> and so I want to talk about this atmosphere. Now, regarding the importance of environment or atmosphere, we know that the scientist understands the delicate balance in the universe to maintain life. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, has to be exactly the right mixture in order to have healthy life on earth. It's environment, it's atmosphere, vitally important for health and life. The sociologist understands the importance of a healthy socioeconomic environment. Kids that grow up in bad neighborhoods, broken homes, violence, the ghetto area, drugs, have less of a chance even graduating from high school and leading a normal, healthy, productive life. That's true. I mean, many of them break out of it, praise God. But if they're left in that environment, the odds are they don't make it to that place. The botanist understands the warm and humid effect of a greenhouse in growing lush, fruitful plants. Ooh, I love that example of a greenhouse. I've always seen our congregation as a greenhouse. So what then is the atmosphere we need in order to be and also to produce victorious, fruit-bearing disciples who follow and obey Messiah Yeshua. In other words, what we're saying is just being a disciple is not enough. We've got to choose the level of our discipleship. And I want to set a vision for that. Victorious, fruit-bearing disciples who follow 
Messiah who actually obey him as Lord. And what is that environment? Well, I spoke about it last week. What did I speak on last week? No, I'm kidding. It's the heavenly environment that the gospel produces. In short, it is faith, hope, and love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, Rabbi Shaul summarizes it. I spoke from Colossians last week about what he understood about uh, the believers there uh, in that congregation, that they were walking in God with faith, hope, and love. He was able to discern, ah, these are the marks of heaven's you know, imprint there. Faith, hope, and love. And now abide faith, hope, love. These three but the greatest of these is love. When the Bible says these three abide, that word abide, and that word connotes something present that continues into the future, abiding. It's here now, and it's going to remain as time goes on. The very fact that these three abide or remain while other things fade and fail, as he talks about earlier here, things like prophecy and tongues will fail and so forth, those things fail and fade. It shows the enduring, overcoming quality in each one of these. So, for example, we've all heard the term, the last one standing. I know it's not a great, you know, it, the last one standing. And that term refers to the final person who endures or emerges. What's that uh, show on TV? Is it survival or where, you know, survivor? Or no, the one that where they're all waiting and whoever lasts the longest. Anyway, I don't watch it. I've just heard it. But the last one standing refers to the final person who endures or emerges victorious from some situation, activity, or pursuit um, while others are eliminated. In other words, they outlived or outlasted everyone or everything else. And what the Bible is saying here is that come what may, faith, hope, and love outlive and outlast all other contenders. This is it. And that's the spiritual greenhouse atmosphere that produces victorious, fruit-bearing disciples who follow and obey Messiah Yeshua. And I want to look at these again. First of all, the victory of faith. Victorious, fruit-bearing disciples. The idea of being victorious means there's a contest and we emerge victorious over it. Either we wrestle it down or we outlive it and outlast it. One way or the other, there's a victory. And I'm talking about our faith in the truth of Yeshua the Messiah. The victory of our faith in Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan, in 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, talks about this spirit of victory, the spirit of faith. We're to be victorious disciples. This is a victorious congregation. It doesn't mean everything's rosy, but it means in spite of opposition and con contest, we overcome. Amen? We overcome. And Look what it says here in, in chapter 5, verse 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. You know, to me what that means is when we are born again of God's spirit, we receive a new spirit. Amen? Isn't that what we believe? And that born again spirit is an overcoming spirit. 
It's an overcoming spirit. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. When our soul comes in line with the victory of our spirit, we become victorious in our soul. Now, King David wrote, soul, why are you cast down within me? Our soul, you know, has a life of its own. It's up, it's down, it's in and out. It's got to be harnessed in line with our spirit, in line with our Messiah. The harnessing by believing. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Yeshua is the Son of God? In that belief, there is a victory. There's an overcoming spirit in it. It's our faith in who Yeshua is and our faith in who we are in him. Amen? Otherwise, we're living in ourselves. So this requires thoughtfulness. There's a victorious spirit in faith. It overcomes. It outlives. It outlasts. Through faith in the truth of Yeshua the Messiah, we overcome the lies of this world. This world is full of lies and distortions. And if we're not careful, we can take a bite out of one of those lies. There are falsehoods, false narratives, and philosophies in life. For example, the false philosophy of evolution that says we have evolved from monkeys. Now, what kind of an environment does that provide? I remember, and I've shared this before, being in university at Temple University and learning about reading books like Waiting for Godot, which is about existentialism. And, and I remember, 18, 19 years old, when I you know, heard about evolution, monkeys, I was so overwhelmed with emptiness. That's what that created in me, an atmosphere of emptiness. Then what is life all about? It's so empty. It creates an empty environment. But faith in Messiah fills the environment with purpose and so forth. Through faith in the truth of Messiah, we overcome religious legalism. Through faith in Messiah, we overcome uncertainty and fear. Instead of fear and uncertainty, faith creates an environment that produces boldness like a lion. The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are what? Bold and confident. We know whom we have believed. We know the truth of God. Amen? We need to have that confidence. That's the environment that we're talking about. Through faith in Messiah, we ultimately overcome sin, judgment, and death. That's the ultimate victory. Why? Because we know resurrection is coming. Resurrection, either Messiah comes and we're alive and changed, or if we die, when he comes, we rise from the dead to meet him. That's ultimate victory. What, is, what kind of an environment does that create for living life? Wow. Yes, this overcoming faith which abides electrifies the atmosphere of our City of David congregational community and energizes our prayers and deeds for God. Amen? That's the kind of atmosphere we're talking about. And that's true of families. Families where faith is in the atmosphere or in a place of work where faith is electrifying the atmosphere. It were, and what about even within our, the environment of our own soul? Faith electrifies and enlivens. Secondly, there's the victory of hope. 
the hope that we have in Messiah. It's a very specific hope. Look in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. That's hope not in a thing, not in an idea, but it's hope in a person. Amen? Whose hope is the Lord. What kind of an environment does that produce? Look in verse 8. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river. And he will not fear when he comes, but its leaf will be green. Look at that greenhouse. And will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Talk about fruit bearing. Here it is. Hope creates that environment, but the hope that is in Messiah. Hope in Messiah gives us a positive, cheerful, and expectant atmosphere. Amen? That's what hope is. It's positive. It's cheerful. It's expectant. With hope in Messiah, we overcome meaninglessness. We overcome aimlessness. We overcome discouragement, despair, and darkness. Yes, hope in Messiah breaks those chains. With hope in Messiah, we overcome pessimism. It's not going to work out. It never works out. Overcome that pessimism, cynicism, gloom, negativity. Hope breaks those negative forces that cause us, instead of bearing fruit, what does negativity do? What kind of an atmosphere does negativity produce? Or pessimism? Or discouragement? It doesn't produce. Amen? It just doesn't produce. Get rid of it. Embrace the hope that we have in Messiah. Messiah is indeed alive from the dead. Our hope is not empty. So this hope, this overcoming hope, creates a positive, cheerful, and expectant atmosphere here in our congregational community. Amen? That's what we want. And then finally, the victory of love. That's final on part one. I have another part coming. The victory of love. The greatest of these is love, it says in 1 Corinthians 13. The greatest of these. Love never fails. I'm just going to read 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, you know, we know the passage in verse 4, love suffers long and is kind. Talk about enduring. How about building a marriage with this kind of an environment of faith, hope, and love? What will that do for a marriage? Versus nitpicking, negativity, all that stuff. What does that do for a marriage? Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. You know, when someone else does great, celebrate with them. You don't get, ah, oh, it should have been me. Why, why him? Why not me? You see, love overcomes all that selfishness. Love does not parade itself. Look at me. Is not puffed up or conceited. Love does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own, is not provoked. You know what that means? Not easily offended. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Look at these enduring things. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. It outlasts. It outlives. 
love never fails. That's a powerful overcoming force. And I want to share what, what I think the crucial thing that love overcomes. You ready for this? The crucial thing that the, the love, God's love, overcomes is self. Self being the root of, frankly, all sin. I once made a list for myself. This is from my card file. I showed Stephen this card file. <laughs> I have a whole list of self here. Self-love. Selfishness, self-centeredness, self-lordship, self-interest, self-indulgence. See, we need to overcome these things because that's our natural state. Our natural fallen state is right here. Of course, it's the cross by which we enter into that. Self-importance, self-pity. Self-preservation. Never let anyone in. Preserving myself. Don't want to be hurt, so I'm going to preserve myself. Never let anyone touching me. Self-reliance. Self-seeking. Self-satisfied. All of these selves. Love overcomes these things through the power of the tree of sacrifice. Yes, the victory of this love is that it lifts the atmosphere out of self-taking to self-giving. That's the atmosphere that produces victorious, fruit-bearing disciples who follow and obey Messiah Yeshua. And I want to take a selah for a minute. You know what selah means. It's a moment when we stop and reflect. Because I have part two coming up. But let's take a selah for a moment. Let's call it a prophetic interlude. And wait upon the Holy Spirit right now. And I want to speak this into, this con into the atmosphere of this congregation. I want to speak it prophetically. In the name of the Lord Yeshua, I speak into the atmosphere here at City of David Congregational Community. And I release the spirit of faith, the spirit of hope, the spirit of love, that overcoming and victorious spirit that outlives and outlasts and brings an atmosphere that produces fruit as we follow the Messiah. I loose it in us as a kehilah. I loose it into our Shabbat school, into the children, into every small group, into every activity that we do, every Bible study, every prayer meeting, that this is the prevailing atmosphere, the heavenly atmosphere of faith, of hope, of love. In the name of Yeshua, Lord God. And we bind every hindrance away from us. Any demonic resistance. We break it and command that it leave. Thank you for electrifying the atmosphere. Energizing the atmosphere. Of our prayer meetings. Of our outreach. Our Motsi Shabbat outreaches. Faith. The spirit of faith, faith in the truth of Messiah, the spirit of hope, positive, cheerful, expectant, the spirit of love, self-giving. In Yeshua's name, Lord God, hallelujah. And I want to ask, if you'll raise your hand, just invite the spirit of God. Let's invite this atmosphere. Please join me in saying yes I want this. Yes, I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of this community of faith, hope, and love. Hallelujah, Lord. Please come. Bring this heavenly atmosphere, an atmosphere for the miraculous, 
an atmosphere for growing as people, as husbands and wives and fathers and children of disciples, of ministers of the good news of Messiah. Come, Holy Spirit, brood over us and create this environment. Brooding, Lord. Let there be a prophetic brooding over every family, every husband and wife. The family, Lord. Let this be the heavenly atmosphere in our homes and even the environment of our soul. Hallelujah, Lord God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Move here, Lord God. Move in a potent, powerful way. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, seal it now by the blood of Yeshua. Amen. Now, that's just part one. Okay, we're not done yet. I know I'm kind of breaking uh, hermeneutical rules on message preparation, but you know, every now and then you got to move out, out of the box, okay? The second thing I want to share today regarding our beloved congregational community is, again, a vision for the kind of congregational community that we can become. And actually, I shared this part earlier this month at, a prayer, at our prayer and fasting. So some of you are going to hear this again. But we need to hear this over and over again. And uh, I want to turn to Proverbs 29, 18. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no revelation, where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. In other words, every organization needs a vision. Where are we going? Who are we becoming? What, where, what, what's gonna, what, what's becoming of us? And with the revelation, there's discipline. But without the revelation, it says, people cast off restraint. They have no reason to harness their energies and move forward. And so I have a question. Can we become, in other words, the issue is, not that we're a congregation. You know, I've said say this over. It's what kind of a congregation. We talked about what kind of a disciple. But my question is, can we become a great congregation? Can we become a great congregation? Well, someone may say, well, I don't know. Why not? Is there any reason we can't become a great congregation? I mean, we have a great Messiah. Amen. He's the head. I lean on him. He's the head of the Kehilah. Is he a great king over all the earth? Is Yeshua a great king? Well, he's going to have a great congregation. Amen. And I want to suggest three ways for us to move into that vision of becoming a great congregation. Okay? Number one, we can become a great congregation by giving our very best. How do you become really good at something? How do you become a good piano player? Practice. you got to... Give your best to it. You've got to give effort in order to do well. Giving our best to the things of God, to God first, but also the things of God. And that is exactly what the scriptures exhort us to do. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3 verse 17 Whatever you do, in word or deed, do it half-hearted. It's good enough. Eh. Eh. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all 
in the name of the Lord Yeshua, the great God, the great king over all the earth, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So if, if we're going to become followers of Messiah, what's the standard? The standard is, I used to choose excellence as a standard, but I realized, wait a minute, how does excellence happen? It starts by giving my best when I'm not so good and keep on giving my best. And as I give my best down on this end of the spectrum, I get a little better and I move, begin to move a little closer towards excellence. I realize excellence, people are at different levels. How could I set excellence as the standard? No, the standard, I believe, is your best. And God knows when you hit that standard. Maybe over time you will actually hit excellence. Maybe not. That's not the issue with God, I don't think. The issue is, what did you put into it? Where's your heart? Amen? So I like that as a standard. Giving our best. Colossians 3, verse 23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Messiah. See, the issue is, what is the alternative of giving our best? What's the alternative? You know, in the marketplace of possibilities, there are alternatives. Well, there's second best, there's third best, or whenever I get to it. So here's my question. Does it take effort? I thought a lot about that this morning, where we emphasize over and over again that we have to put no effort into our own salvation. Amen? We cannot put effort and think that we can somehow achieve salvation. It's a gift from Yeshua. Amen? We don't work and try to achieve salvation. But what came to me this morning, and I added it to my notes, wait a minute, what about after salvation? Does God expect us to put effort into our relationship with God. What do you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. He expects us to put effort into our walk with God and into the things of God. We give our best in cultivating our personal relationship with God our best efforts at meeting with God. I'm urging you, give it your best. All right, you got discouraged, you missed it yesterday. Get up today and do it. Amen? Don't let discouragement of yesterday linger with you today. Start today. Give your best effort to meeting with God. Of course, I believe that the morning is the best time uh, but it can be any time that works for you, okay? Uh, the morning is, a, is a, an excellent time to meet with the Lord. Amen? You're going to put effort into that? I'm calling you tomorrow morning. Are you up? Who wants a call tomorrow morning? Milva, you want a call tomorrow morning? All right. I want everyone to call Milva. <laughs> Five? Hey, tomorrow's Sunday, girl. <laughs> we give our best in gathering together on Shabbat. Amen? We give our best to the worship service. That means we've got to be here when it starts. If we're going to give our best, we've got to be here. Amen? It common sense. Give our best in our assigned ministries. If you're ushering, whatever, sound, all the different ministries, give our best in tithes and offerings. You know, some people have the attitude, they come and flip a tip. I'll give God a tip here. Take a tip. Do we have a tip mentality or are we giving our best? The tithe is the first fruits. It connotes the best. It implies the first and the best. 
We give our best efforts in reaching the lost. When was the last time you made an effort on your go list? Ooh, the go list. How many are praying over your go list? Come on, I want you to get back to writing your go list. It starts with the no list, people you know, who you can have an opportunity to somehow bring up a spiritual conversation, and then go, make the call, go and visit the go list. It takes effort to win the lost. Amen? He's worthy of our best. Oswald Chambers captures it in the title of his book. What is it? You know what it is. Our utmost for his highest. I couldn't say that any better. What does it mean, utmost? What does that connote? It means effort. You know, Rabbi Shaul in Philippians, when he says, forgetting that which is behind and reaching forward, that word in Greek is agonizomai. It's the word that we get agonized. I'm putting every strenuous effort into what is ahead. He put effort in his walk with the Lord and his ministry. That's who we can become our very best. Why settle for less? Anyone have a good reason for settling for less? Secondly, we can become a great congregation as we look for the best and bring out the best in one another. Again, this works in marriage. Giving your best to your marriage, giving your best to your family, works at work, giving your best there, looking for the best and seeking to do what you can to bring out the best in one another? Isn't that a working definition of love? I think that's a great definition of love. Look for the best. Seek to bring out the best. Doesn't love bring out the best in us? I read it before. Love suffers long and is kind. Doesn't envy. Doesn't parade itself. It's not puffed up doesn't behave rudely, does not seek its own, but looking for the good in others, and so on, not provoked, thinks no evil. Love thinks no evil. What's the opposite of looking for the best? Eh? Eh? Uh -huh. I remember reading a book about, you know, being positive and about, uh, you know, bosses. It was a book on bosses. And it said, uh, you know, once you catch someone doing something good, instead of catching them do something not so good, catch them doing something good and tell them, you know? Catch someone doing something good. Bring out the best. If we're to become a great congregation, we've got to look for the best and seek to bring out the best in one another. And finally, we can become a great congregation as we expect great things from God. Expecting great things from God, and therefore attempting great things for God. William Carey said that. He's a pioneer outreach leader. Expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. Can we expect great things from God as a congregation? Let's make the decision. Can we expect it? Come on, let me hear a solid yes. Yes, we can expect great things from a great God. And if so, should we not attempt great things for God? You know, several months ago, I was struggling. How are we reaching the community? And I came across that website, you know, and so, hey, a whole vision. Let's do this. Let's get the cards, the I Found Shalom cards. Are you using those cards? You can attempt 
to use those cards are on the back table. And I said, well, why not put these on buses? So we attempted it. We raised money, and we're doing it again. We're attempting something for God. That's why every week I'm, I want to pray for this. I want to close with this verse in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3 verse 20. Should we attempt great things for God? Here's the answer. Now to him who is able to do a little bit. I mean, why trouble God? He's so busy. Why would we even think we could trouble God with our little... <laughs> now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. How does it work? According to the power, can we read those four last words? That works in us. That means, my friends, we have to make an attempt. If we do nothing, all this power and energy is trapped. It's released through faith an effort in serving the Lord. Hallelujah. A great congregation is energized by an atmosphere of faith, hope, and love. And it's composed of people whom the Lord is making great. You know, you're being fashioned into his image. <laughs> you're being made great. There's no one greater than Yeshua the Messiah, and we are being fashioned into his image. Yeshua the Messiah overcame the world. Amen? Do not fear. I have overcome the world. We too are overcomers. Whatever is born of God is already an overcomer. Yeshua the Messiah bore fruit in his life. As we follow and obey him, we too can bear fruit. A great congregation is composed of people who give their best. And by giving our best, we become our best. A great congregation is composed of people who look for the best and bring out the best in one another. And a great congregation expects God's best and therefore attempts great things for God. Amen. That's who we are. That's who we can become. Lord, I want to thank you for this vision. You're not calling us to be stagnant, not calling us to status quo, not calling us to live in the past. This is the way things were in my city or my country or my other congregation. Things may have been great there, but we're here now. Amen? Here's where we are. Where do we go from here? Lord, thank you for this vision. Thank you for the spirit of unity in the congregation. Thank you for a wonderful congregation of committed believers. We're committed to you. We're committed to Israel. Committed to the Messianic Jewish vision. Committed to the vision of reaching Jewish people with the good news of Yeshua the Messiah. Thank you for this, Lord. In Yeshua's name, amen. Why don't we stand? Let's worship the Lord for a moment. We're going to have our prayer team come up in just a minute. A short time of prayer. Spirit of the sovereign Lord, come and make your presence known, revealed. The glory of the living God. Can we start again, if you don't mind? My apologies here. Spirit of the sovereign Lord, come and make your presence known with me. The glory of the living God, Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, come and make your presence 